Hi, everyone. I'm Angel Borelli, and this is Season 7, Episode 6 of The Fix. And I have something really special for you today, and I am so excited about it. A few days ago, our friend to the show, Coach Larry Owens from Bellarmine, asked if I would be open to doing a face-to-face video call with his pitchers. The great news is, is that we recorded the video meeting so I could share it with you as today's podcast. The pitchers asked great questions, which led to many interesting topics, ranging from training to throwing programs and many more interesting questions. You can access this podcast on YouTube so you can get the many visual demonstrations that went along with the discussion. My YouTube channel is Angel Borelli Pitching. If you have any questions you would like covered in my next podcast, please email me. My address is angel at gymscience.com or message me on Facebook at Angel Borelli Pitching. I thank you in advance for listening and enjoy. Um, We'll get going here. Thanks, Angel, for jumping on this call with us. I wanted to I, I talked to you, of course, I've been friends with you for quite a while now. I don't even know how many years we're going on, but just from listening to your podcast and uh, you've been a huge resource for me to um, to reach out to and discuss various issues as in regards to pitching. And so I thought this might be a pretty good opportunity for our players to benefit from maybe getting to hear from you as well and more or less. I guess and initially I can open it up with a couple of questions, but I just kind of wanted to go through and just walk through maybe some do's and don'ts as they navigate um, the off season. Um, it, what kind of opened it up is I had a pitcher and we can start with this. Maybe uh, I had a pitcher reach out yesterday and ask me about throwing a football and what my thoughts were on it. And my initial thoughts were, you know, cause he said, I've heard it can help with arm strength. And I think, that's something that you'll probably dive into. You don't gain arm strength from doing things like that. You, I don't know, it may increase the amount of layback, whatever, but my, my, I had concerns about it. I'm not a huge fan of it. I think that it can fix some arm path problems some, sometimes, but other than that, I'm just not a huge fan of it. Um, I don't know. That, that's one question in particular. Um, and that and then, is, that's a great question to start with because what it does is it brings in the way that you have to think about things when you see ideas about what a pitcher should or shouldn't do. Now, this pitcher is not present right now. Did he say to you that he wanted to do it for the reason of arm strength? Mm, I think he might be all too. Devin, are you on here? Devin is the one that asked the question about the football. Yes. And Devin, was your intent with that, that you thought that it might give you arm strength? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so first of all, I don't expect you guys to know what I'm about to tell you because your job is baseball and mine is to understand motion mechanics. The worst thing you could do for yourself as a pitcher is to throw a football. Now, here's the reason why. The football, so let's picture a quarterback right now. He's standing up straight. The football is in front of him. It's not behind his head the way you put the baseball because, number one, he's got to throw that ball pretty quickly to save his life. Number two, the ball weighs almost a pound. So what he does, he actually does a position with his arm that is what a pitcher would be doing if he was leading with the elbow. So the arm is up. Can you see my arm? The the elbow's in the front. The football's out here. He throws from his elbow to his hand. Okay, that is the way a football is thrown, out in front. And, and the most common injury to a quarterback in the shoulder is the supraspinatus muscle, which is the top muscle of the rotator cuff that's on the top of the shoulder, right where the seam of your shirt might be. That muscle is also frequently injured on a pitcher because its job is to keep the arm raised at the side. And it also is involved when you get ready to accelerate. So by using a football to throw, you'd have to throw it like a football. You can't throw a football like a baseball. Your arm would be in a leading with the elbow position. You would not be getting 
I mean, when pitchers say they want arm strength, what you really want is you want strength through the acceleration muscles, which are the chest and the lat, the main dominant, and the serratus, the dominant accelerators. You're not even using your shoulder on that. You're using mostly your elbow. So throwing a football has completely different motion patterns than a baseball. So you would not get arm strength from that. In fact, strength, when you want strength for throwing, you want to do that in the gym. And you do that by doing the correct lat and chest exercises for general strength, some that are more specific to throwing. And then you have to make sure that your accessory muscles, your arm muscles, which are your upper arm muscles and forearm, are equally as strong. So arm strength would come from the gym, not from throwing the ball. And you would mess up your shoulder and mess up your acceleration pattern that you have built in your head for pitching. So it could hurt you physically and also hurt your mechanics. Does that make sense to the guy who asked that question? Is he saying yes? yes okay. Okay. Awesome. Did I answer the question thoroughly for you? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Good. Good. Okay. Good. Awesome. Um, I, the first of all, I guess does does anybody have any questions right now? I have some more, obviously, and we can probably do this for a while today. But does anybody have any specific questions? If so, just. Um, I have one. Um, I would like to ask, uh, what would be some of the best ways that you would improve grip strength? That is something that, you know, obviously as a pitcher, we're going to need at all times. But what is the one way that you would say to improve or increase grip strength for, for us? Okay, so when we're talking about grip and we're talking about the way we use a ball, the ball, you've got your fingers across the seams. Don't laugh at my four seam. My hands are small. That's pretty good, right? Yeah. Okay, so... When we're talking about grip, you have to work on the grip of the fingers themselves on the seams, okay? Those fingers need to be strong. We also need to be strong across the joints here that are actually the knuckles because the knuckles move as the ball rolls up. Then we also have to be strong in the wrist. The other place you have to be strong and have range of motion is in the thumb. Because the thumb changes its position. The thumb is what causes the ball to be thrown off center. So like on a slider, it might be up at the side. On a cutter, it's going to be over further to the, towards the baby finger. Oh, how many of you are lefties besides um, Larry? Okay. Me. Sorry, Larry. Ross, no. are you lefty? No, I'm right-handed. Oh, okay. Sorry, Larry. You're going to have to transpose again. No, I know. Okay. I'm not Okay. <laughs> Even lucky as a left, you're left yes. So when we yeah. talk about grip strength, I love your question because I'm a fanatic about it. You want to think about the wrist. You want to think about the thumb range of motion. You want to think about the fingers. So one of the, I have a million different ways. So first of all, the fingers are just this part. So rice bucket for just the fingers. I love using a weight. The only thing I use weighted balls for are for wrist exercises. I love taking a, a, having the guys take this as a heavy uh, weighted ball. It's 11 ounces. And I have them work pressing very hard, working with just this group of muscles here, which you also can work in the rice bucket because there aren't many things you can do to recruit that. The other thing that I love is taking a plate a gym plate, tell me if I don't hold things at the right height. And I love taking these two fingers, which when these two fingers get fatigued, by the way, these two fingers, the pitching fingers, insert at the inside of the elbow. When they get fatigued on pitchers, guess what goes? Not the velocity, the location, which is so awesome to know. So what I love doing so that they can get more weighted work is to take these two fingers inside the plate and then their thumbs here, sort of like the way it's wrapped. And then they start doing this motion because the fingers are involved in all of this. So they're doing this, 
They're also doing this, which is not only the curveball grip, but it's also one of the things these two fingers act in. So by getting this kind of thing going with the plate, then with the cable at the low pulley, of course, flexion and extension on the low pulley. They're on the floor, forearms are resting on a bench, and then they're doing this and they're doing extension. For reverse curls on an easy curl bar, for the forearm isometric strength. So it's a reverse grip, easy curl bar, so it's on an angle and they're doing a curl. And the forearm and the fingers are working, but the forearm staying in an isometric sort of work, which forearm muscles need to be able to work. The forearm parts that work as a flexor of the elbow need to be able to work isometrically. And of course, for forearm, the forearm function is supination and pronation, which pitchers change that depending on the pitch type. So you're going to take something that's like a, a bar in a gym that's like this, hold it at this end, and you're back and forth like that. But getting the grip. Now, this is a baseball that has a rubber outside, and it's got, so if I throw it, it drops down. So what I have the guys do with this, because it's smushy, is I have them work gripping, squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. There's no better way to work the grip of the ball with the fingers than squeezing. And the thing is, it's very specific to pitching because you're always pushing against the ball when you deliver it. Now, one of the things I want to say to all the pitchers that are listening is the biggest issue we have with pitchers not missing their spots is that the ball rolls up into the fingers too soon. So you don't get a chance to do the fantastic thing that you guys do with your pitches. That's a matter of pulling against the seams and having the hand and the wrist work correctly. The fingers create the location and the movement. The fingers do not add velocity. The wrist adds velocity. So you have to have a good grip on the ball. Now, I know with pitches you're taught, oh, don't hold it too tight. Don't do this. But when you're in max external rotation, which would all the pitchers here put their arm in max external rotation for me? So you're going to look like this. Right back there. Pretend you have a ball in your hand. Grip it. There's 44 pounds of pressure on the ball at that time in a major league pitcher's hand. And if he doesn't have that pressure there because of the position of the ball and the acceleration, which comes after the ball, as it moves from facing the sky to becoming like this in the hand, the ball slips too fast and you lose the control of the fingertips against the seam. So the grip has to be the greatest at max external rotation. So what I have my guys do, they take either a ball that's heavier, they might take something like this, always have them work with the regular ball, and I have them back here squeeze, 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 and then I have them Put, apply more pressure than they think they need to, and then to come through acceleration and just release it in a net, you know, 10, 15 feet away. And it's amazing what it does. For you pitchers, the most important thing is understanding the motion and what you're doing. That's how you make corrections. You have to know in your brain first. Ross, I loved your question. Because you know what? It's the priority training. And the cool thing is that people don't get, when you get a UCL injury, everybody calls it an elbow injury. It's a forearm wrist weakness problem. It is not an elbow injury. And all the muscles here that I just described, under your knuckles on the palm side, all the wrist muscles insert on the inside of your elbow and on some on the outside, but pitchers usually get inside elbow problems. So if you don't want to have an injury, you have to train the hands, 
the wrist and the forearm, and that's how you stay safe. And also, it does amazing things for your pitches because your fingers can actually do the talking on the ball, which is what makes the pitch happen. Anybody have any questions about that? Anything I said? Angel, with uh, priority training we talked about, would this be something that you could target and do in the weight room in conjunction with all of the other lifts that you do as well? This Absolutely. might be an area or a priority that you could hit on once, twice a week or whatever. Absolutely. My guys do something for their wrists, fingers, or forearms almost every day, except if they're fatigued, because some of the stuff you do with releasing a ball. So when they're on the field, prior to, let's say you get to the field and you've got to practice. Ross, you're out there with them, right? Ross, you're out at the field yep. with them because you're also a pitching coach, right? A coach? Yes. So, yeah. So don't think of exercising only in the gym. In the gym, you can do the weighted stuff that you need cables. The rice bucket can be in the gym. The reverse curl bars in the gym. For the cable exercises in the gym. The plates in the gym. But when you're out at the field, get your baseball, maybe a weighted ball, and you practice your grip and work on, okay, I really want to feel these two knuckles here because these knuckles leave the balls the first part. And if those knuckles work right, the, the fingers will pull against the seams. So you can do this. You can get back here, feel it strong, work, squeeze, 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 then come through and throw. You can create a lot of different ideas. And most of my pitchers, when they have it in their hand, they're going to do their own thing. They'll pick it up and they'll be doing things with it and with different wrist positions for our finger positions for their pitches. Make sure you use all the different pitch grips for when you're working with the ball. So yes, and the only time you wouldn't do it is if you feel tired from something. Very good. Very then you good. take a day off from it. Right. What about, does anybody, anybody, Drew, Nog, John Cato, Adam, anybody have any questions so far? I've got I've got some more that I can keep. Yeah, I've just got, I just got a quick one. I know you're not in big into weighted balls, but do you see is there any benefit with doing like a ball holds like before? Because like what I like to do before I pitch is I take a weighted ball and I just do some like quick like holds with it. So I'm not, obviously I'm not throwing it, and I just think that that like really like loosens everything up. Is mm -hmm. there any? Is that a no-no or would that be okay? Well, so first of all, you know, my job is to educate you. And, of course, I have to do all the research. So my guys do not throw weighted balls. But just so you know, I know I'm aware. I mean, Haraldus Chapman throws a weighted ball before his bullpen. I mean, it's hard to argue with that. However, as a scientist... I wouldn't let my guys do it because of the risk. So in terms of, um, quote, unquote, me being against long toss or throwing it, it's because there's too much evidence. And there's other ways to get your arms strong, plus the mechanics change and the forces change. So you're right, Jacob, not to be releasing it. Now, to use a ball and not release it, to get a certain feel, let's say, what exactly do you do? Do you go through the motions of the pitching? You'll come out of your glove, you'll come here, you'll go back and go forward. Right. I usually, I, like, I just stay straight and then just that I'm not, I, I'm not. So you'll like, do something like, like this. this? Yes, exactly. Yes. So, okay. So that's a great question. So just now I did it twice and I can feel it on my shoulder. And I use I do that all day long with the regular baseball. So it does act like a dumbbell for the pitching motion. So here's what you need to know if you're going to do that. So inside your shoulder, and this is the same reason why you have to be careful the hitters do with putting weight on the bat. It went, there's little messenger, messengers in your every tendon and every muscle. And if you pick up this ball, and you start doing your motion with it, 
the reception in those uh, receptors changes because it's used to this. And then you do maybe twice the weight and those receptors go, oh, okay. So you start doing that. And I assume when you pick up a regular ball to throw it, it feels real light, real easy, right? And you feel like, whoa, I'm going to throw harder, right? Jacob, is that correct? Because I mean, yeah, you feel it's, like it's, it's lighter. Like pick yeah. this up, it's like nothing. Exactly. So when my guys do wrist flips with this, when they get the regular ball, I have to move back to catch it because, or the whoever is catching it, because that ball is going to fly. Mm. But that doesn't mean that the ball is going to accelerate differently once you're in your motion. But here's what we know. Whenever you use something that's heavier than the implement and not releasing it is okay, but you have to reset the receptors or you're not going to have control over the ball. Do you understand that? So your first throw right after you do that is different than your third, fourth, and fifth one, correct? The oh, first yeah. one's like crazy. So you have to understand that you have to do that. And for any of you out there who are long tossers and you believe in it, here's the only recommendation. And take this to the bank, please. Because you're quadrupling the forces around the elbow and shoulder, especially when you get out beyond 170, you have to recover from that long toss bout the way you would recover from a bullpen because the forces are increased. Please don't do it before a bullpen or before a game. It would be the same reason as why Ross wouldn't have you do flat benches, incline benches, and decline benches and then send you out into your bullpen, like five minutes later. He would never do that. Long toss is like a weighted exercise, so you have to recover. It's why it doesn't fit in most baseball programs, because when are you going to throw? So now you have to take a day off. It's like, well, what's better, a bullpen or a long toss session? So unfortunately, it, it's a popular thing. That's why I have to educate. So if you're going to do it, remember, you've got to recover from it because the elbow and shoulders are thrashed after it way worse than pitching. And also know your mechanics are completely different, your stride and everything else. So also know, I don't like calling it practicing pitching. It's Throwing a heavier ball a long distance. That's what it is. It's not really working on your mechanics because the trajectory is different. So the muscles, the, sh the chest muscle, which is an accelerator, is working differently. So I would rather see it be labeled correctly. My biggest problem with it is that it's called something like to help your mechanics and it's different mechanics. And also there's not enough talk about recovering from it. If you're doing a long toss session correctly, meaning you're doing all the distances and everything, you got to take the next day off of throwing. Does that make sense, Larry? Yep, absolutely. And that's one thing. I mean, that's a tough, that's a tough subject because there's so many, like, I remember when I threw, I, it felt good to kind of stretch everything out. They think yes. of it as, they're stretching everything out or you're building endurance or you're, do, you're doing something that's a benefit to you. My take on it has been, I, I leave long up to them. Mm -hmm. What is long? Long could be a hundred feet. Long could be 120. Long could be, I've seen, I've seen guys, I had guys in the minor leagues that would throw the damn thing almost 300 feet. I mean, like it looked yes. like, I mean, with the guys with serious arm strength, it looked like a damn tee shot. Come right. on. You're like, God. And I've seen guys throw it way the hell up in there. We had Dylan Axelrod in the minor leagues who pitched a little bit in the big leagues. Dylan's from out there in California, I think. But he liked to do it, and he threw it straight the hell up in the air. And we're yes. like, and he would. I, that's one thing I think where some guys, I don't know. I, I, I don't think that it's. I, I'm kind of. I'm on the your side of the fence. I think. I, I'm not sure the benefits out outweigh the risk to it, but 
I'm never going to get in somebody's way for trying to do something that they think can help them, provided I try to educate them as much as I can about it. And I don't, I don't know. That's a tough deal. I, yeah. There's there's guys that will live and die by, yeah, I so long. And I think yeah. it's the best thing in the world. And then wow. there are others that, like, I know your guys, I think Joe, Joe never is long tossed. Joe wow. Demert, 11th round pick through two or three years ago for her, never threw long. I mean, so I'm, I kind of let them, I, I think, it, I don't know. Yes, it's a, it, it's a tough position you're in. And I, when my guys go to school, when they go to a coach who lets them do their own thing, they're in luck. And the ones that have to throw long toss, the biggest issue is some of the coaches don't let them work into it. They just say, hey, you got to go 220 today. So here's the thing. So first of all, I don't have the luxury of, I mean, my guys work with me one-on-one -on -one, and I'm not an instructor in the sense a guy comes and sees me one time. I develop these guys for years. I engineer them. And I treat the pitching motion as a precision skill. So anything that looks too close to the skill, but isn't the skill, bothers me. You know, there's a drill I've seen where a right-handed pitcher leads with his right leg out instead of his left leg. That makes me crazy because I know too much. I know somebody's laughing. They know what I'm talking about. It makes me crazy. And trust me, I spent a long time looking at it saying, what could they be thinking? It makes me crazy because if the nervous system is so precise, it's so smart. And you guys have spent your life pitching. I mean, you don't even have to think. I think it's amazing the way you guys can just change your grip in the glass. I mean, when I have to demonstrate something, I have to go, okay, turn the ball, do this. You guys don't know how highly developed your systems are. To go in the middle of that and change something is weird to me, especially when it's unnatural. And I don't care what the benefit is. When you are looking at trying to intervene on a pitcher skill like that, you better be sure you're not messing something up. So when I see long toss, I don't like it being called pitching practice. It's not. Please call it, I'm throwing a heavy ball or I'm throwing a long distance because it feels good. And if you label it correctly, then you don't get your insides mixed up with, well, I'm practicing having a great arm action or arm strength. The lower pet pulls the arm downward for the trajectory. To throw upward, you use the upper pec. So just with the acceleration muscles per se, you're not working on quote unquote strength for accelerating. So I'm happier if a guy knows, hey, I just like to stretch out my whole body with throwing. And you know what? I don't blame you. You're confined to 60 feet, six inches. It must be awesome. But remember, you're using your entire body. You're stretching out the whole thing. So it is probably very cool. Now, because I know the forces that are increased on the elbow and the shoulder, I can't have my pitchers do it. Because guess what? I'm going to want them to recover First of all, I don't want to expose their, their structures to extra force because they're getting enough in pitching. Guys get injured pitching at 60 feet. Why do I want to do something that isn't really helping their pitching, but it's going to possibly challenge their structures? That's the reason why I don't do it. We're busy every day working on the 60 feet, six inches. It's their job. My job is to help you guys keep your job. So I'm like, why do I want him to do that? If he says, Angel, it feels good for me to stand on my head and walk around on my hands, I'm going to say, fine, do that when you retire. But right now you're not standing on your head because your shoulders need to be strong. So that's how I make decisions. I don't have the luxury of saying, well, do what you want because I'm so working one-on-one, -on -one, it's my responsibility. The more you know, the more you... So I try to find out what, what turns you on about it, and maybe there's some other thing we can 
we can do. But anyway, that's my take on it. But please just know what you're doing and be aware. So if all of a sudden your shoulder starts fatiguing on the mound, you go, God, you know what? I long tossed yesterday. My arm isn't fresh today. Maybe you'll go ding, ding, ding. I need to take some days off from it. So yeah. that's really, and, and I understand the dilemma because yes, it's a, a popular thing. I think the, the, the keys for me would be if, if they're going to do it, I try to try to in their mind, let go of the ball eyebrow level so that they're at least, I don't know where anything again, anything that would <laughs> discourage them from throwing it up in the air. If you're going to throw it longer, at least do your best to, well, all yeah, it it, I don't know. to try to change it isn't going to help. If they're going to do it, they need to do it full blown because their body's doing it the way that it needs to do it to hit the target. If the guys, their partner's 220 feet away, they're going to have to have some vertical and horizontal movement. The pitcher knows how to get the ball there. If you start trying to alter that, you could cause more problems. In other words, if you're doing something that's so scary. It's like saying, oh, you can drive home drunk. Just please open the window, you know, and make sure both windows are open and make sure your seatbelt's on. But, oh, I'm worried. But but do it this way because it, it's like, no, you do it or you don't do it. You know, once it's dangerous, it's dangerous. So you have to. Yeah, it's a tough one. I'm still I'm still in the middle. Yes. I don't know. I know. It's a tough yeah. guess, Rick. I got a quick question. Um, I'm sure Ross and Larry get some of this, but high school level, I get a lot of it. What about the two-way guys that need to throw along because they're outfielders? They have to. Just the middle and part that's, of the stage. That's why we don't put. That's why I say, please don't put your pitcher in the outfield. Okay. You're okay, but absolutely. So, for example, at 120 feet, the mechanics start to change. If a pitcher crow hops in from 75, he's going to have the same pitching mechanics, same forces. I'm more concerned about forces and mechanics. At 100 feet, always crow hopping in or slide. I like pitchers to slide step in, shuffle step in. Their mechanics are sound. Their body's probably good. But at 120, we start to see changes in the mechanics and the forces. So if you in high school, a pitcher who is at first base, he's got to throw 126 feet to get to third. So I'm like going, please don't put him. Well, you know, please don't put him in the outfield. Please don't put him in the infield. Please be a P.O. <laughs> That's what I always say. But the problem is you can't do that. So and the shortstop, the pitcher shortstop, which is common. But. The outfield is deadly, so the 126 feet is the most innocent. The arm action of a catcher pitcher or a shortstop pitcher, that's deadly. The outfield is deadly, too, because you're right, Rick, they have to do it. But they're also having to do it usually during the same day sometimes as they're pitching. So... That's why it's deadly, and I don't know how to resolve it, except that they have to do and practice their skill. And if they're in the outfield, they've got to throw. Right. To, I don't know. How many feet is it to the cutoff, man? In fact, sometimes they try to go to the plate, right? Uh, so they're what? 200-some yeah. feet? Yeah, 20, 30 feet sometimes. Yeah. Yes. I measured, I measured it. It's about 160 to 180 feet to throw the ball to the cutoff man, like, for example, from where you would have a chance to throw someone out at home plate from right field to the where the cutoff man would be, it's around 160 to 180 feet. And we're saying yeah. throw through the cutoff man, so you're trying to get right. it there. Right. So. Yeah, exactly. Of course, why are you going to – right, you're always hoping to get it to the plate. It's why we don't see it in the major leagues. That's the one thing the major leagues get right. Of course, they've got the money, the players, et cetera. But you don't see them allowing their um, their pitchers to do those other things. And then look at the one that we know did, right? And he hasn't been doing so well. The, the guy from Japan, multiple positions, he had some problems. Yeah. So it's scary. Yes. It's, pitching's a delicate precision skill. Cool. Um, what about... 
what are some in the off season as the as our pitchers are kind of transitioning? It's a small transition that we spoke of on your podcast from uh, the fall being shut down to them having to crank it back up again to get ready to play in the spring. So it's a small, small window, and they're going to have to be able to lift and begin to throw and throw downhill together. Uh, what are some major do's and major don'ts that you'd see as these guys like if like if you do anything, guys, these are this is the most important thing or one of the most important things. And these are some definite things to certainly stay away from doing. So are you got, are you talking about specific exercises or are you talking about? OK, yeah. so here's some specific things to remember. And Ross, you probably know these things. So I'm doing a lot of what I call hybrid programs right now. It's not binary the way it used to be. You're off, you're not off, you're throwing, you're not throwing. Everybody, the, sh the time off is so limited right now. So my guys are, my guys who are on flat ground right now, they're still training like they're in the off season, but I'm giving them recovery time. So they're not throwing as frequently. So normally I might have somebody on a throwing program every other day. So now I've got a guy taking three days to get his body done. He takes a day off. No, he, he next day he pitches. He throws, excuse me. So what I do on that third day, so on the fourth day he's throwing, is I even do legs on the third day because the soreness usually hasn't set in till late the next day. I make sure his chest gets done well in advance of that throwing day. And then day after throwing, he takes off and then he starts his cycle again. So one of the things is the day after throwing, usually you don't want to be training or you can train back and triceps easily the day after throwing. What you don't want to do is have your biceps be sore when you throw. That is the most dangerous thing because your bicep, one of your heads inserts into the labrum of the shoulder. So even during the year when you're training, you've got to be cognizant of that. That's why we do a lot of preacher curls. We do a lot of hammer curls. We do exercises that innervate the different parts of the arm that aren't going to stress that labrum. So that's how we do. We make decisions about body parts. Does that make sense to you, Ross? You probably already are following some of that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exercises you don't want to do. You don't want to do pull-ups unless they're assisted. Because, and upright rows have been contraindicated for the rotator cuff for many, many years. So that's not anything new. But I think the biggest thing is, and I'm not a fan of planks for that reason. Planks are very overused exercise. I'm not sure the benefits, but the kind of pressure that goes into the shoulders for a pitcher, you're getting compression. There's no reason, you know, moving, be bench pressing. I'm an aggressive strength coach. My guys all bench press in the off season. They bench, they do decline benches in season. But when you're doing things, pressing down onto the shoulders and it's an exercise that doesn't have the greatest value, then I just throw it out. So, but pull-ups are one of the things that I see pitchers doing because a lot of their strength coaches have a football background, the ones in high school, and that's a big exercise. And it's a great exercise for developing the upper body, but to hang your body weight off your shoulders is not a good idea. So those are just some basic rules. Following, making sure the biceps is not ever trained the day before or day after not pulling your weight off your shoulders, not doing anything that compresses your weight into your shoulders, where it takes the arm and pushes it into the socket. Because remember, your arm is always re going outward. The rotator cuff is pulling it in. There's a very fine balance there. You don't want to upset what your body's figured out how to do to keep you healthy. So do any of the pitchers have any questions about anything with their motion or the motion or their training? Drew, Burr, Dalen, anybody? I have a question. I have a question. Okay. Well, earlier this fall, I had like a problem with my pronating mass here. And yes. I was wondering what exercises would be good to, I guess, build that strength back up. So what I kind of crank it up here in the spring i'm not afraid to let it go and it won't hurt what types of pitches do you throw 
uh, fastball, slider, changeup, and a curveball. And when you started having trouble, did you feel it while you were pitching? And if so, which pitch or pitches? It was a fastball is what I felt it the most. Okay. Okay. So everybody probably understands why I asked that question. So, okay. You felt it the most. Did you feel it on the others? Um, no, not really. Not Maybe really. occasionally the changeup, occasionally on the changeup, but not, not on the slider or curveball. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the question that Ross asked earlier when he was asking about the grip. So the pronator, it's called the flexor pronator mass. And it's got all the flexors of the wrist and all the flexors of the fingers all attach right into that thick part of your forearm there. And the pronator itself turns the forearm. So if you're throwing a curveball, you're supinating when you throw it. If you're throwing a slider, you're probably, because of the position of the thumb, probably slightly pronating a little more than on a fastball. Correct? A little bit more thumb down. Okay. So. The deal is, is that um, you're, when that gets tired, when that gets aggravated, that is always coming from fingers or wrist. And how was your, how hard you, how, what's your velocity on your forcing on a good day? Well, I've been up to like 92, but it's usually not that high. It's usually just like 89 to 90, 90 okay. area. Okay. So the first thing is the pronator mass, the flexor mass. You have every exercise that I mentioned to Ross at the beginning of the program is how you get that better. But the reverse curl is a critical muscle for you, a critical exercise, because that works. It, it may, may the brachialis of the upper arm because the biceps are not innervated when the palm is down. So as a flexor on the upper arm, it's the brachialis. But on the uh, for the forearm to get that kind of isometric strength in there, so the forearm itself, had, the pronator itself has to be worked in pronation, reverse curl, but also the supination and pronation that I showed, you would take, you know, the push down bar at the gym, push down straight bar at the gym. Okay, you can take that, grab it at one end. So now it's heavy. If it's in the middle, it's not heavy. On this end, it's heavy. Move it up if it's too heavy. And you'll be going back and forth. And you need to do that with a bent elbow and a straight one. And those two directly work the exact area. The other things you have to do are to do the wrist flexion and extension. So those three are three strength exercises. You've got to get in with your fingers into the rice bucket and with things that are developing your grip that, you know, any tools or balls that you can squeeze. Believe it or not, it's critical that you be able to do that. But Looking at how that happened is important. Like, why did that all of a sudden start? And that means you need to look at your pitches, et cetera, in terms of what which pitch is actually the problem. Miss Angel, um, yes. would would Drew Burr be able to use a hammer for that supinated and pronated exercise you were talking about with the bar? Absolutely. I've seen that used a lot for a lot of people. Yes. A hammer is uh, great. Uh, push push. Hammer. Uh, yes. A larger or smaller hammer. Even something that's going to load the top of that that handle to where you can turn it with your arm bent, uh, Bert, and anybody. Yes, and they actually have equipment. Uh, you can maybe uh, talk to the equipment guy. They have equipment for, for a forearm pronation, a supination, where you put plates on just one yeah. end and you hold the bar. And you hold the bar. Hey, Ross. Yeah, I think uh, Tisha actually has that in the training room. It's like a it's like a baseball bat handle. It's got two yeah. weights on the end of it. Yeah, you can, we can. Oh, and a baseball bat's great to use as well. Yeah. If you use the baseball bat and just keep moving it to where, but remember, you have to have your arm straight when you do it, and then you have to have it at your side where it's bent 90 degrees, like this. You have to have it at your side so that you are, because you have more range of motion. The muscles of the body are complicated, and the forearm's the most complicated part of the body. 
Some of the muscles are innervated more with a straight elbow. Some are innervated more with a bent elbow. You have to do both. Okay. And on the reverse curls, you said you wanted like, is, is my hands going to be angled like this instead of being like parallel to the ground? Is that, were you talking about that earlier? For like a safe reverse, reverse curl? Reverse curl. So you know what an easy curl bar looks like? Yeah, yeah. You know, I you know it, yeah. okay. So uh, it's like a W. So you grab it about like this, that width. Okay. So it's going to be on the part where your hands are angled this way. Okay. Right. And you, of course, bring it in and you do it like a normal curl. Do you understand that? So it's like a normal curl. You're stand, it's straight at your bottom and then you come up. And it and what it's doing is is working the brachialis on the upper arm, which is the dominant flexor of the arm. But the pronator is in an isometric position the whole time because your hands pronated. So you're getting a different type of strength there. What I think you need to do is take all your pitches and take a baseball also and go into a net 10, 15 feet away. And do wrist flips, fastball, change up, change your grip. The only one you can't really do, it's tough to do a slider that way. You could try it, but the curveball and the other two are, are good. And I would definitely do that and investigate. One of those is aggravating you. One of those is probably the culprit. Does that make sense? So, Drew, did I answer your question? Yes, yes. She okay, does. and then Ross Ross understands all the things I was mentioning to him about the fingers, so you can consult with him on that. Do you guys have a rice bucket? No, I think do Tisha have, does as well. You know yeah, what? Well. So important. And no, you do not cook the rice. Just get a bunch of pounds. I, I have been asked that question. That's why I'm bringing it up. Get a bunch of pounds, put it in a bucket. And every one of you guys should have one at home because it's a fantastic way to get your the muscles of the fingers and the hands. Remember what you do, all the motion and all the stuff we're talking about all leads up to this. This little thing here, 21 percent of the velocity comes from the wrist. The fingers add the movement. I don't care what you're doing before then. If you don't do this right, I don't care if your shoulder's rotating 100 million miles an hour, which is what applies the major acceleration. If you can't hold on to the ball, it rolls up too fast. Your thumb doesn't fit where it wants to. Your wrist is tight. Forget the rest of the motion. It all happens right here. And not enough is said about that. In fact, I have pictures that have said, Nobody's ever told me to think about my thumb. The thumb is what creates the off center on all your off speed pitches. It's important. Your ring finger is critical to, to delivering a fastball inside or outside. Down and away. I'm saying when you want a fastball just inside or out, that is a very important finger because that's kind of controlling. That's the little adjustment you're making to move in or out. So your fingers are everything. Think about your fingers and your wrists. Don't forget them. And just there's not enough talk about it because it's not your job to know these details. It's people like me that are supposed to remind you and educate you on that. And there's just nobody's interested in it, but I'm uh, obsessed with it. Because I think it's what it's all about. Awesome. Good stuff. Anybody have anything? Anybody? Uh, any, yeah. Anybody? Jump in. Uh, so I've heard a so, lot. So uh, of... can I go to the. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Let's let Nolan go first and then Dalen. Since Nolan jumped in there first. So Sorry. I've heard a lot of different opinions on benching and pitchers. And I was wondering what you think think about bench press and pitching 
Well, the chest and the lats are the major accelerators of the uh, pitching motion along with the serratus. And the serratus, if you ever look at a picture of a bodybuilder and you see these like finger-like, oh, when you look at somebody with six-pack abs, okay, and you see these finger-like projections that come around from the side right here, and they're like cuts, that's your serratus muscle, comes from the inside of the shoulder blade. The serratus the chest and the lats are the major accelerators. As a strength coach, if I want strong chest, my guys are going to bench press. It's a matter of when you do it, and it's a matter of doing it correctly. And I am a huge, in fact, in the off season, my guys do flat bench, incline bench, and decline. Decline bench pressing is your best friend or decline presses. Anything on a decline bench, because that lower pec is what brings the ball down. That's the activated, most activated part of the pec. Incline push-ups. And incline push-ups are, my guys do them all season long. Because the incline push-up, where you're taking like the squat bar, and you're putting it down low. So it's like three feet and you just lean against it. Incline work low pack. I know it's counterintuitive. When you've got your feet up and you're down, that's working the upper pack. So it doesn't make sense. But the incline push up, the flat push ups, I love push ups. And um, the benches, I love too. It's a matter of when you do it. So whatever you do, you have to recover from it. And so this this is why a pitcher has to be completely organized. Now, I do this for all my guys, and they're so used to it. They don't make a move. They're like, what? they know when they're training what. And I do it around, like if they're in season, I ask the coach, when do you want your guys to do pens? When, what did they play catch every day? Okay, and when's their game? Okay. And then I work out when they're going to do what, because you can't have a sore chest and shoulders. So on benching, your chest, your anterior deltoid, your triceps, and your lat are all going to be involved. So you just have to know when to do it. In season, my guys don't bench. Once in a while, maybe a decline bench if there's a reason, but normally I use incline push-ups instead. Um, because the weight, they're using so much weight because they're beasts. And it's like, it doesn't fit in and it takes too long to recover. And remember, they're on a cycle where they've got to, the first thing is the calendar is created by baseball. You got to work in around it. What was your question, Ross? Do you use barbell benches is my question. When you oh, say yeah. Benches? When I say a bench. Oh, yeah. When we're talking bench pressing, we're talking Olympic bar. Dumbbell dumbbell presses are something completely different. They do them all year long. Yeah, because the range of motion is dictated more by your shoulder, whereas with an Olympic bar, the range of motion is dictated by the bar, correct? Because the bar is coming to your body. So it's a tighter range. And you, in season, need to go to your range, not to the bar's range. That's the major difference in it. But it has to be done correctly. Your grip needs to be wide enough to where you're at 90 degrees. When you get your grip in too close, you start to get pinching in the front of the shoulder. So, yes, that's it, Larry. You got it. Okay. Oh, that looks good. <laughs> so big. So, so big. <laughs> Does that make sense? Nolan, did I answer your question? Yes. Uh, I have one more thing about that. So, like, if we are going through benching, mm -hmm. what type of, like, weight should we use? Like, I'm assuming we probably shouldn't try to max out on bench press. Okay. So, when a, when a strength coach is talking about how much weight to use, I've never tested you. I don't test my guys anyway in that way. But so I can't say 70 percent, 80 percent. So we talk in rep patterns. So just hear this. If I tell you to do 16 reps of something, which I would never do. But let's say I said that, you know, well, it's going to be light. Yeah. But it still means at 16, I want you to be done. 
So if I say I want you on a 10 to 12 rep pattern, that's still, I mean, if you can lift something 10 to 12 times, it's not that heavy, but it still means I need you to be done at 10 to 12. In other words, 13, you would fail. Okay, but I don't want you working so heavy that you fail at eight. That's what a 10 to 12 means. When my guys are in the off season, so seven reps is the rep that is the lowest for hypertrophy, meaning getting bigger. And it also gets you a good amount of strength. Now, why am I making a differentiation in that? Because I know what's going on inside of the muscle. I'm trying to remodel the muscle in the off season. I want your muscle so much bigger that when we make you stronger, it can be stronger because it's bigger. So we change the real estate first, how much you have. And then when we make that powerful and strong, you have more to develop. So you change strength coaches cycle your training to change your rep patterns. So you just pitch, you come in the gym and I'm doing post pitching. I call it post pitching training. And you're going to do some, uh, you're going to do a machine fly just to stretch out that pack. I'm going to go, I'm going to say 12 reps because after pitching, oh, that feels great. I'm not trying to remodel you. I'm trying to open it up, bring blood in. It's off season. And you go, I go, you're going to do flat dumbbell flies. And I'm going to go, I want seven and nine reps. Because I want you getting bigger and maintaining strength so you don't get weaker. So your best rep patterns for size. So if you're a bodybuilder, you're going to go eight to 12 reps, but you're going to fatigue at eight to 12. I like my guys to train between seven and 10 because they're getting size, but they're never losing the fibers that are strong because your body lets go of the bigger fibers really easily. And I don't want you to lose any of your power. So my guys work in the seven rep range when they're in that cycle. When we are initially in off season, they're doing fives because that's strength only. So I like to do a strength cycle. I like to do a big a cycle where they're getting bigger. Depends on how they're training. And my guys actually do, some of them do Olympic lift, uh, weightlifting with me. But they're doing it right. So now did that answer your question, Nolan? So are yeah. you pitching Are you pitching or throwing right now? I am not currently. Okay. So your rep pattern right now, because you're getting close to it, Play it while you can, I always say, 7 to 10. And you'll feel that you're getting bigger and stronger at the same time. That 7 is very important. So you have to discover what is your 7. And it's going to change every day. So you get a guess. First set, 9 reps, you go, okay. And for every 10 pounds, you're going to lose a rep probably. So you get down there, you do 9, you go, okay. If you did 8. Well, I don't think you're going to add that much weight to it. You know, if you if you got six, it's too heavy. Does that make sense? So you have to discover where do I fail in that? And you want to learn what your last rep is. You want to try not to fail on a rep, meaning you couldn't complete it. You want to push on the last one going, uh oh, this is definitely my last one. And then you rack the bar. Is that. Yes. Yeah. I had, I have one more thing on that. Is there a point where you could become like, like too strong to where it's like not functional? Like, is there a point where we should stop doing like heavy lifting or stuff like that? You mean like in the eighties when they used to say the pitchers were the big babies on the team because they were only ones not lifting weights? No, like <laughs> that's how it used to be. No, it used to be that way. I exactly what you're saying okay. so it, it, it and another way to say it is is it true that you lose range of motion when you lift weights and you get too tight if you lift weights incorrectly you will lose range of motion if you hunch over on a bicep curl you're going to thrash your shoulder 
If you don't stand up straight when you're training, you are going to have bad posture forever because it will train you in that position. If you train, I have never stretched other than a hamstring now and then. I have never stretched a pitcher's chest or his shoulders because I don't like stretching. It loosens the capsule. We want you tight in there, but stable tight. You, If you're with perfect range of motion, you can never be too strong. There is no such thing. And if you have a limit, because you are limited by your weakest link. For example, you might not be able to bench press two. How much do you weigh? Uh, About 230. Okay. So you may not be able to bench press your body weight because your triceps are too weak. Or you might not be able to bench press. Your strength coach is laughing. I don't know why. (laughs) Okay. Don't don't give away his secrets. You may not be able to bench press your body weight because your anterior deltoids are too weak. The body's great. It doesn't let you. And this is the same for velocity, guys. If you guys don't know how to decelerate and have a good follow through, your brain is not going to let you throw 100 miles an hour and end up down on the ground like some of those pitchers that I've seen that they finish their pitch and they fall to the bottom of the mound. That's a brain that's not working because normally if you don't have the brakes, your brain's not going to let you do it. So you might fail at a bench press, not because your chest is weak. So if you use correct technique and your brain is functioning normally, you will always be within what you're able to do, but always go to the max of what you can do. Never be afraid to hold back. And plus, intensity in the gym transfers over to intensity on the mound. In fact, in relationship to the long toss topic, the one thing I like about it is it teaches you to be intense. Some of the stuff, the drill, weird drills I see people do, they go, this helps my pitching. What they're doing isn't helping them. What they're doing happens to help them be more intense. You guys need to make a decision to be intense. Velocity is a choice. Your brain has to decide first. I'm throwing the heck out of this ball right now. If you don't make that decision, your nervous system doesn't kick in the big fibers. So the gym teaches you how to be intense, how to get through certain situations you take that to the mound and now you're ready to go so Mm -hmm. long answer to your question don't worry but make sure you're doing everything correctly okay okay amen are you done nolan yes okay dalen i think you're next yep all right so kind of backtrack into talking about uh compression of the shoulder it kind of came to me when you mentioned uh, the bridges, you're not a fan of bridges. You also just mentioned um, about stability in the shoulder and mm-hmm. that and the importance of that. What are your thoughts on like overhead um, weight training? For instance, like a kettlebell hold here mm-hmm. with that. I know my previous program um, that I've been following, um, that was a key and a key aspect because obviously throwing is an overhand. Absolutely. Um, but- So you need strength above the head. Kudos to your strength coach for knowing that, because some people I've heard say, oh, the pitcher should never go over their head. What? That's ridiculous. I mean, it's ridiculous. I'm not a kettlebell fan for pitchers for any exercise, because remember, I've been talking about the wrists and the fingers. So you know how you hold on to the handle and then there's some space and then there's the ball? That's a weird moment for the wrist. I would prefer a grip on a dumbbell because the lever is different. And you're shaking your head like, you know what I'm talking about? It's like you're struggling to handle not letting that heavy end pull you down. You see, you know? And it's yeah. not, but yet you're not, you're not getting a full grip on the weight that you're trying to balance. It's, so I don't like, when I look at it, it's not the kind of lever that I want for my pitchers. So I don't personally, we don't use them. Anything we would do, like my guy just yesterday was doing an uh, overhead walking lunge. Yeah. But I had him take a plate and hold it. Okay. okay. 
snatches, they're over the head. Clean yep. split jerk, that's over the head. But I like the weight to be secure in the wrist. So we're not taking an exercise that's for the shoulder. And you're worrying about your wrist. First of all, it's counterproductive. So you're not getting the full, in other words, you're not using the major amount of weight you could because you're worrying about the weirdness of the balance. And are you yeah. following me on that? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but no, absolutely. Overhead presses, you know, pull downs, critical. Up and overs, critical to have those shoulders be able to go overhead. So that was a great question. I'm glad your strength coach said that because I love hearing that people understand that because many old school coaches are like, no, you don't let my pitchers never go over their head. Well, that's kind of crazy. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> Good stuff. Anybody else back there? Anybody else have anything? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? They won't get that one. The old guys do. The young guys do. There are all these people in the circles on? Because I only have so many photos. I think, yeah, I think they're on. Oh, yep. darn. Nobody has any questions? Yep. I don't, I'm not sure. Any pitching? Anybody? Anybody? I don't know. We've been on for an hour and 20 minutes or so. or. So I think it's this is great. This has been awesome. Um, this is I don't know. We're very fortunate now that we have someone like Ross who can kind of oversee and be a we have a strength coach now. In the in the past, we had one strength and conditioning coach and he oversaw over 400 student athletes at school. So it was if we had an Achilles heel, that was it. So now we've added another strength conditioning coach. But they still that's all they do but by having an assistant coach that we were able to hire in the off season that has this background i think it's just been great and so i, I think you know in, in anything like like these types of meetings with you where we can take what they're doing and enhance it reinforce it there's a different idea well, i mean it's, it's great i think it's this is awesome so this has been i think a huge benefit to me and and hopefully everybody else and um I don't know. Hey, I, I do want to mention the when you were talking about the inverted and decline push up mm -hmm. type thing. Remember, we did a podcast on it. And just so you know, guys, I'll find that podcast and I'll share it with you all so you all can listen to it because it was pretty neat. It was a question I'd brought up, but it did. You 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 talked about the different layers of I think the pec muscle that mm -hmm. interact with accelerating the ball at different mm -hmm. times. So I thought it was pretty interesting. So that, I just I wanted to touch on that too. That we you actually did a podcast on it specifically on it, and it was one that I was on there with you. So I wanted to I think because it was a question I asked or something. Yes. Now, guys, one of the main muscles that you want to just be crazy about training all year long are your triceps. When I ask my pitcher, so believe it or not, none of my pitchers have ever been injured. I mean, seriously, my guy that got drafted, his medical folder literally was empty. He never even saw a doctor. When I asked him, what do you think? And, and he was doing a lot of showcase, not showcases because he was signed pretty early in, in uh, high school for his school. But when he was going to these perfect game things where they're all on top of each other in the summer and he was like pitching his butt off. And I said, why do you think, he says, I, I, I handled the whole thing. I said, well, what would you attest that to? He says, triceps, the back of the arm, the triceps, two thirds of the upper arm is a huge muscle. And it's so important to not be afraid to train it hard. Plus one of the heads of the tricep, the long head actually inserts on the scapula so it's a stabilizer of the shoulder. So on my last podcast, it was a quick 15-minute thing. I gave three exercises that all pitchers should do. If you haven't seen it, you can go on YouTube and it's boom, boom, boom. It's not, I just went, hey, do these three. They're for the lats and the rear deltoid, the exercises I showed. But they work the long head of the tricep also so the long head of the tricep is a very cool muscle it has additional actions other than just at the elbow don't be afraid to train your triceps and those of you who are in off season train the heck out of your biceps 
hammer curl should be done all year long. It's the most dominant elbow flexor in the fastball. And the reason why I think it's dominant is because it's stabilizing the inside of the elbow. So everybody knows what a hammer curl is. Okay. Do And back training, when you pitch, get in the gym that night or the next day and put everything in place by training the back, the lats. And what it does is it puts integrity back into the back and it stretches the front in a passive way because you're contracting the rear. So my guys would come in after games and practices and we would do back and triceps. That's what we call post pitching. Back and triceps, we would have rear delts thrown in there. They would recover like crazy. So don't be afraid to go in the gym because you know how you feel all tight, creaked up. And Larry, if you have them doing my warm up program, the recovery program part of that is essential to pitchers to put everything back in place. Remember, if you get behind the eight ball with tightness or anything, it's hard to get rid of it once you're pitching. You got to stay in shape. And the harder you throw, the better outing you have, the more you have to do that. So pitch, restore, recover, and then pitch again. And it's not the pitch count. It's the recovery you get for the pitch count that matters. I'm a fan of a pitcher going as deep as he can, although I guess the rules don't allow that anymore. Do they, coaches? In college, right? you're good. Yeah. You, you're good? Yeah. There's awesome. My- Yeah, I mean, I don't know how a pitcher can find out who he is unless he doesn't go as deep as he can. Rick, do you have any questions? You're muted, Rick. Oh, yeah, he's he's muted. Yeah, thank you. There you go. Uh, Most of them have been answered, Angel. Thank you so much. Um, Larry and I talk most every day about almost everything you've gone through today and then some because we're nerds. But, um, and I pick his brain every chance I get. So, um, I'm I'm most curious about the long tall stuff because that's something that that I've always I always did as a pitcher. But um, but I'm 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 I heard your podcast and I was um, I've seen Nolan Pender, who's as strong as anyone on the planet, throw a ball through a fence. I think, and I've seen him a day after he pitches throw from the right field fence to home plate. So um, I think the knowledge gained by these guys will be critical going forward. So yes, thank you. It's huge. I, I, I really appreciate you doing this for us. It's uh, awesome. Hold on one second. Drew's raising his hand. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Drew. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, what are your thoughts on, like, cool downs? As, like, um, I'm not sure, like, velocity trainer, but more like a – I know you're talking about, like, intensity. Like, that would just be, like, an intensity trainer. But does that help with, like, the pitching motion as well? Or Did you say pull downs in the gym? Yeah. Oh, no, no, like throwing. No. Uh, no. Like, like oh. throwing. In throwing, you mean where you're throwing long toss, but you're concentrating on put, pulling the ball down? Not so much on long toss. Yeah, some, maybe like an extended, maybe like 120-ish, but somewhere I'm trying to like throw it hard, like belt eye, like just chucking it down there. You think that's like beneficial for me or could that somehow hurt me in a way? Do you think it's beneficial for you? Yes, I think it's beneficial. Okay. So the first thing is, is you want to think, my job is to help you learn how to think. Secondly, the reason why that feels so good to you is because you're actually pulling down, not the way you do at 60 feet, because the trajectory is different. So if anything helps you keep the ball down at 60 feet, that's awesome. And that is the lower pack pulls your arm down. So when we're at working with cables, We go from a high cable to a low cable, a single arm. That's working the low pack. So pitching, you're here. You're downhill, giving you that advantage. You're at the top. So that's pulling down on the ball. But if I'm back at 120 and I have to throw up and then pull down, you're only getting a big pull down at benefit because you're up higher. So it's still not the same as, I mean, if you want... Here's what I'm going to tell you to do, and then you can contact me and tell me what you found out. Stand on the top of your mound and shuffle step down and pull down into the net or catcher's glove, a glove, make it precise, and you tell me 
if that works better for you than at 120 feet. Remember, if it's flat, if it's more than 60 feet, it's not pitching. And it's not, it's, there's no such thing as, I have pitchers call me and say, I, I couldn't get them out, so I did my pitching flat. No, you didn't do your pitching flat. You threw with a pitching motion on flat ground, but it's not pitching. Pitching is you're up high, the target's low, and you're going downhill. So I want you to experiment for me, and I want you to work out the perfect little pull-down distance for you. Shuffle step in from 75 feet to 60 and do it flat, then get on the hill, maybe shuffle up the back of the mound and then pull down on the way down. And then you tell me if that's better than the 120 feet. And I bet you anything, all these witnesses, that you're going to say, hey, I found the perfect way to work it because you're on the right track without keeping the ball down. But your body will do it the right way if you have the right variables. Okay, keep things as close as what really is going on. And don't be afraid to use the mound to work on things. Yeah. Anybody else last minute here? Hi, Shane. I finally see him. Hi, Angel. <laughs> Good stuff. Why? I, I thank you a ton, and I'm sure that you know. I, you know, if our guys have any other questions moving forward, I mean, they can run them through me. I can get to you, or they, you know, I'm sure could just reach out to you individually, if or email you, or however you want. I don't know. I, if there's something we need to find out, I think we got a really good source. So um, I appreciate all your help and your willingness to, to come on and do this for us. Oh, well, listen, thank you so much, and it's been an honor. Hey, everyone. I hope you loved this show. I know it was of a different style, but because it was of such value, and I think there's nothing greater than hearing questions right out of the horse's mouth. So please, if you have any questions that you want answered or you are interested in being on the show, please email me at angel at gymscience.com because I want all of your questions heard and answered. Thank you again for listening, and I'll be back at you in two weeks.